welcome everybody to San Diego Comic Con at Home 2021. Yay! Uh, I'm Marla Isaac. I'm the talent liaison at Image Comics, and this is the genre and character development panel for Image. We have some really awesome writers here to talk to us about genre and developing their own characters and, and making good comics. Um, so I'm just going to go around and introduce everybody real quick. Uh, first, we have Joe Henderson, who is the co-creator and writer behind Shadecraft and previously Skyward with us. Yay! <laughs> Alex DeCampi, who is the co-creator and writer on Dracula Mofo. Mm. <laughs> Very tasteful splatter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have Declan Schnappi. Mother Lover. Oh, Mother <laughs> Lover or Mother Fluffer, as I used to say. Uh, Declan Shelby Born. and Rory McConville are the co-creators and co-writers on Time Before Time, a new book out with us. Very exciting. And Jeremy Holt, the co-creator and writer behind Made in Korea. Woo! That's out May 26th, right? Yep. Yeah. It's Wednesday. So, by the time this is out into the world, it'll be out there and you'll all be amazed by it because it's great. <laughs> how are you all Do you doing? Like ask how, uh, Jer yeah, how, how, Jeremy, how are you feeling about it? Because this is your first, your first book and I know you've been like, you've been working well, on creating anyway. stuff for years and, years and years. Yeah, it's first image uh, book. It's um, surreal. Um, but I, I think the timing is pretty serendipitous considering I've just been, you know, thinking about with you know Bong Joon-ho winning for Best Picture last year, and then uh, Lee Isaac Chung and, and Chloe Zhao winning or getting nominated this year, I think it's a, an exciting time to be Asian American in media. It's also a really good book, and you can tell you've been working for years on creator-owned stuff because it like it comes out and it's like the art is gorgeous, the lettering is gorgeous, the story is great. Yeah. It's it's fully formed like Athena from Zeus's skull, kind of like bam, there it is. Um, so you can all go read it. It's very very good. Yeah, it looks sharp as hell. I haven't read, I'll, I'll have read it by the time this comes out, I promise. But uh, it looks sharp as hell. The art is amazing. And, and yeah, you can tell it's somebody who's been making comics for a while, you know. Mm. Anyway, sorry. Marla, uh, you know, no, I got this. Good. I got the question. I'm gonna do, I'll just do this. I mean, feel <laughs> free. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll probably talk about some pretty, pretty basic stuff. But at first, I kind of want to get a little idea about what your books are about just like if you want to introduce your books to us really quick just so we can kind of get an idea of um your vision your your process with the book um joe since you're to my left uh we can start with you sure. so uh shadecraft is a story about 16 year old zadie lou who is afraid of her own shadow which she probably shouldn't be because she's 16 but maybe she actually is right to be because uh in our story maybe shadows are more dangerous than we think. And it's a story of a 16 year old facing the fears within and without uh, and the physical manifestation of the fears that we all experience. I really like telling stories that have big crazy ideas, but an emotional heart to them and a very simple emotional core with Shadecraft. It's as much as it's shadows coming to life and everything, it's the story of a brother and a sister and her dealing with living in the shadow of a perfect brother um, for far too long of her life. So. A really good summary i yeah <laughs> i've been i was practicing in my closet uh, for an hour <laughs> before this so. uh alex you want to go sure um dracula um mother lover <laughs> uh is a pulp reimagining of uh the dracula story of, of bram stoker's dracula specifically um it, in which I was trying to make Dracula scary again um, and also find you know, a logic for his victims. It's really about cycles of abuse um, and uh, escaping them, um, just drenched in this like really dazzling art from Eric Anderson that's this incredibly technicolor, uh, vivid um, jello style art. Because it, I get so fed up with Dracula stories where Dracula's like wandering around in this, in this dinner jacket that you look that like it just looks like it smells like mothballs and they stick them in London and it's very dull because you're just trying to like you're trying it was an attempt to modernize gothic horror but and while getting rid of most of the trappings of it and trying to retain the heart of it which is which is just the fear 
Um, and it's a very different visual reimagining of Dracula. And it's a very different take on the brides um, mm. uh, are set around young Quincy Harker, who's a uh, photographer in, in Los Angeles in, in 1974. And he basically is on the crime beat and he's freelancing and he photographs corpses. He's, he's like a modern day VG. He, he spends his life at night uh, uh, profiting from the dead, much as Dracula does, or feed, essentially feeding himself off the dead, uh, much as Dracula does. And they meet and it's not cute at all. <laughs> um, that's kind of funny timing. I just watched uh, Dracula Dead and Loving It for the first time last night. The Leslie Nielsen movie. Have you ever seen that? It is a long time ago. Ooh. When it came out, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's uh yeah. I had watched part of it when I was a child in the 90s, but oh boy, yeah, that is it a, sounds like the exact same feeling. thing that it's kind of very <laughs> <laughs> I mean the, the one thing I do a lot in my work, just building on the discussion of genre, is, is I, I I love genre and I love its tropes and I love like immersing myself into it. But I also like doing little things that take those tropes and kind of turn them on their head or play with them or look at, I, I feel that very few people like really reimagine or like really look at why, like how genres work and how they appeal to people and then start like interrogating that and like poking at the holes in it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's yeah. that's something I do almost constantly. Yeah. But while, you know, trying to very much retain the people who love the genre, this isn't like, oh, genre is something cool. I mean, like I'm too cool for it like, you know, certain things I've seen. Um, it's more, I love this, let's play, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, having fun with it. Um, Declan and Rory, you wanna tell us a little bit about your book? You wanna go, Rory? Um, well, I guess I have to know. <laughs> it's, uh, so Time Before Time is set in a dystopian future where for the right price, you can get this organization called the Syndicate to transport you back in time to a so-called better life. Uh, the main character is a guy called Tatsuo, who along with his friend Oscar work as smugglers for this organization. And after having done it for a certain amount of time, decide that they kind of want to break out of this life. Uh, and steal a time machine from their bosses, but quickly discover that even with a time machine, you can't escape from your past. So basically what you're saying is like, I can go back to that really bad decision I made at 14 years old that my brain keeps like hitting on at 3 a.m. when I have anxiety. <laughs> you, you can go back, but you can't change it. Yeah, you can look at yourself while you're yeah, doing you it. You can observe yourself <laughs> and use that <laughs> horror that you want. No. We live that horror, got it. You can, yeah, you can make it worse. The, yeah, you can go, what the hell's wrong with you while you're doing it? <laughs> so you can't change it. Yeah, the first issue is great. The second and maybe the third will be out by the time this is out, but oof. Right. I thought you were about to say the second and third are rubbish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> After that, it's just good. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's drawn by uh, Joe Palmer and colored by um, uh, Chris uh, O'Halloran and um, a letter by uh, Hassan Asmane Alao. Actually, I don't know if I got his, if I said his name out loud before, but um, uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah, our first issue is already out and like uh, we're, we're delighted with how, how, how it's gone. It's a great team. Yeah, it looks really good. And it is really good. Thanks. Oh, I, no one's showed it yet. Ooh. Yeah, I'm just going to keep this up there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeremy, you want to tell us about Made in Korea? Uh, yeah, Main Korea's focuses on uh, Jesse, which is um, a surrogate child. Uh, this is set also in the future. It is an AI story uh, set in a world where children are no longer being born. So a void happens and people start wanting to raise synthetic children. And so a tech race emerges and a company in South Korea happens to build the most realistic uh, children as proxies. And uh, a bioengineer at this company ends up uh, cracking the, ho uh, the code of the human consciousness, but realizes he does it on company time. So to basically protect his algorithm, he uh, uploads it to a, um, a discounted proxy who gets adopted to a uh, biracial couple in Texas. And the story focuses on adoption identity and uh, coming of age. Mm. It's excellent. The scene where he kind of discovers it and then tells his like coworker about it and is like, oh yeah, you can't be doing that while you're on company time. And then him being like, oh yeah, totally. Like, 
I'm not doing that. It's it's not anything. God, that yeah, that was intense. That was very real for anybody who's done day job work. Um, <laughs> yeah, especially Feel that. The day job. It's like, how do you carve out that time? And uh, yeah, so it's um, it's been really fun just to kind of explore my own uh, experiences and feelings about being a transracial adoptee, and I. I feel that um, AI, good AI stories are kind of rooted in an adoption experience. And I just mm. have never seen anyone do it directly. And I thought this was a great opportunity for me. Hmm. So kind of playing off of that and also what Alex was saying earlier, um, how do you kind of keep a genre fresh? Like what in your mind, what are the steps that you go through to make it not cliche, not tropey, like, add a new spin to it, but still keep the essence of that genre? Or do you not think about it? Um, I, I definitely think about it because, I mean, AI is kind of this beloved um, topic within sci-fi and it was kind of daunting to kind of reinvent the wheel. Um, and for me, I didn't really want to focus on the hard science of it because that really wasn't the mm. point of the story. It was more about um, what makes us human ultimately. So um, yeah, I kind of just really wanted to tell a story that I would obviously like to read and I wanted to draw from personal experiences. So there's some heavy elements in the story that I don't really want to talk about it because it would be a spoiler, but there are things that I have thought about for the last 20 years. There are things I've um, interacted with or experienced firsthand. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that it was kind of uh, perfect for this story. Yeah, I think we were in a similar place with them um, time before time in that um, like a lot of the feedback we're hearing is kind of like, oh, like, um, you know, a lot of time travel stories and, and, and everyone has the same specific kind of questions as in, you know, how does it work and can you do this? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's strange, the very similar questions keep coming back because they're very much mm. of that genre. Whereas what Rory and I are kind of, are, we're mixing two effectively, we're kind of doing a crime story within a sci-fi story and we're kind of avoiding all that stuff. Um, not that like, not that we don't know what we're doing, but like kind of what Jeremy was saying, like you don't necessarily want to just explain everything up front. Um, that's, that's the idea isn't necessarily the interesting thing about it. I, I, I've often uh, said like, I think ideas are BS, but um, it's, it's how you execute them. And that I think, I think it's how I, I, I'm expecting to, uh, it's happening with Jeremy and um, but with us is, is, how, how, how you do it is, sorry, I'm, I'm talking about myself here. I think, I think how, you, how you do it matters, but it's, I can't say, well, maybe Rory feels differently, but I can't say we said like, here's the staples of a genre that we need to get around. It just kind of came a lot more naturally as regards the story we wanted to tell. And then the kind of sci-fi elements are not necessarily window dressing, but like they're, but what they're not, they're not the, the, the genre isn't the story as such, if any of that makes sense. I think you can love a genre too much mm. and it makes you less effective writing it in a way. I mean, I wouldn't say go write things you hate, but like if, if, you, if you're so aware of like every piece of media within a genre, it, 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 it's almost very containing because you're not able to just approach it in a fresh way. So you know, yeah. everyone was like, oh, did you watch a ton of Dracula films before mm -hmm. Dracula Mother? No, I did not. Um, I, you know, I, I had the ones I knew and weirdly a lot of the inspiration for the book came from um, anime, from um, yeah, things like Helsing and things like uh, Madoka Magica, um, Pride and FMA Brotherhood. So I think part of it also is, is looking at things that are tangentially related, like, you know, and it helps interrogate what a genre is. I mean, I will, like until the day I die, I will claim that the great Waldo Pepper is one of the great, the best Westerns ever written. Um, it's not a Western, really. It's about airplanes. Um, <laughs> William Goldman's like absolute genius. Um, so I think part of it is is there's just a story you want to tell, like because I start a lot with character, which is I think what Declan was was also starting with, um, and emotions and feelings, uh, and you know it's partially in react reaction to events, it's a reaction to things in my own past. It's tangentially related to usually totally not different movies I've gone and seen. Um, and then out of that, you know, you, you tease it in a notebook for a long time and write and write and write. And eventually like all of that morphs into 
something that feels like a story and characters that feel like people. Like for me, it often takes a really long time. That's why we're still talking about Dracula rather than like my next image book. Cause I do, I, I, I do the thing slowly. I'm gonna make the exact opposite point to Alex, which is actually the exact same point, because I think there's something very important about both not overstudying something, but also knowing what else is out there. And I think it's all in that balance because and I think I think there there's sort of two sides of that exact same coin because everything Alex you're talking about, like you have all you're talking about all these influences. And I I have a pet peeve whenever I talk to people who are like, oh, I don't watch TV, I work in TV, or I don't really read comics, and then they, you know, try to write something and you're like, oh, that's been done often and better. I remember being on a show and someone pitched something. I'm like, that was Homeland. That's on the air right now. That was happening right <laughs> Already now. Like, happening. What's Homeland? Does anyone really watch that? I'm like, like Ooh. being aware of the stories being told while not being so indoctrinated by them that you can't innovate them. To me, that's mm. the, the tricky line that I try to walk that I think is so fascinating to watch, walk because like you don't, I always, it's funny, you see like a lot of filmmakers do their passion projects and Alex, to, to your exact point, like they don't, they, they have no perspective and they're so beholden to what they love about it. They don't actually, um, they don't actually make the best version of it. It's that mixture of perspective and knowledge. I think that's always key. And then to everyone's point with heart, with emotion and yes. heart and everything has to ultimately come from that. Well, as, as just to, to follow up on what you're saying there, um, so as, as an artist, it's something I always always drive me crazy when I would see like artists saying that they're they're not reading comics. I'm like, how do you know? Like, you need to know what's coming out. Like, like who's doing interesting stuff? Like, nobody makes interesting work in a vacuum. And mm -hmm. something that like is going to give you an idea, or someone's going to push you creatively. Like, if you see, uh, it's, I hate it when I see an artist's work, and I'm like, oh man, that's amazing you know and then you feel crap and then you kind of try to charge yourself up again and you know you need to kind of know what the pulse of things are like oh, i'm gonna steal that or oh that's a really mm. trick i love yep. that like or that page turns like really cool mm. the way they do that. and so i think there's there's part of the immersing yourself in what's out there um is is you're always learning um and I, you know i'm not talking about like full-on just ripping stuff off but you know, I'll often be watching a movie and see a bit of dialogue or a scene change or a bit of camera work where I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna file that away for later. Or like, a, a, you know, someone's done something really dazzling with color or 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 um, layout or art somehow in a, in a book, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna maybe I can use that. And then when I eventually do use it, it looks totally different because I'm applying it to my story with my characters. But it's definitely been inspired by what other people are doing. And if you're not mm -hmm. looking at what everyone else is doing across a variety of media, you know, you're, you're limiting your own learning. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's ongoing education. And I think that um, the special ingredient, I think all of us uh, add or infuse to our stories. And this takes time to develop is, is writing your own personal narratives, weaving them into your fiction. Because I realized that I've been shying away from writing my own personal stories into my work because I just had this assumption that nobody wants to kind of Hear about my problems and when i decided to lean hard into it um it resonated with uh, editors it has resonated with readers and i think um but it takes time to cultivate that confidence to be able to do that i think that's a pretty common thing with writers i wonder it's like it seems like a lot of the feedback i get is like well nobody's interested in my story and what i have to say i don't have anything original but like media on a whole is not original. Like yeah, nothing's you know, original anymore. So you might as well write from what you know. The advice I always like it, it takes a little while to get over that fear of ex exposing yourself in a way to the wider audience um, and writing about quite personal things or you know, not necessarily just like wholesale taking things out of your life, but something that you remember that you find hard to write. Um, and then I, and then you get over it and you're just like my trauma here. <laughs> um, my friend's trauma, my grandma, my generational trauma. Like, oh, no one is here. <laughs> we have the best job in the world. We pay uh, we pay other people to read about our problems. Uh, people, other people pay us to read about the, uh, our problems. Um, you know, most people have to pay therapists. We have an audience. Well, and, 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 to, to, sorry, sorry, John. No, you go. I was just going to say, as I guess something Riaz Marla said, like uh, uh, tropes. I I kind of get annoyed when people talk about tropes as they're as if they're just an inherently bad thing. Like yeah. to me, 
their tool, you know, their tools. Their, there's there's a way mm. of telling a story, and there's nothing wrong with them intrinsically. It's necessary. It's how they're used. They can be used in very obvious, um, stupid ways, or you can do th- interesting things with them. And um, I, I think that's kind of an interesting uh, place to play. But um, I, 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 I actually wanted to ask Rory because I can't remember, like, you know, was it we did really really talk about genre too much when we were putting this together? Because I know we were, we were definitely thinking sci-fi, but then it then it shifted into into back into crime naturally. Um, I don't think we ever talked about in the actual terms of genre. Like, I mean, I suppose we talked about some elements of the time travel genre and things we wanted to avoid, but that was probably the most of it, as far as I can remember. Do you guys have a genre you kind of like drift back to? I mean, the running joke between me and my agent is I always write thrillers. Um, in that like, I'll call him and say like, I'm, I'm doing a story about this. And he goes, you know, like, it's a romance. Okay, Alex, how many people died in the first chapter? And I'm like, yeah. It would be crime for, yeah, it'd be crime for me. Both Rory and I did a crime book last year. A graphic novel, and then this was to this was to be something different, to be more <laughs> not not <laughs> crime by, and it's a crime story. I anyway. still remember Savage Town, which is still a book I love. Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks, thanks very much. One yeah. Dex early like creator owned image books. I remember that. Me too. Um, but yeah, but, but no, yeah, and, and, and um, th- things that I just you know, I, I it's not it wasn't deliberate. I think I remember just me and Roy were kind of sh- shooting things back and forth, and once it became more of a grounded crime story with sci-fi elements it became a lot it just it clicked for me more and, and rory too mm. and um so like it's all the questions we get are about the sci-fi aspect of it but it's to us really that's that's a mechanic we had to work out but it's not really what the, the story's about you know yeah and that's not for me with sci-fi that's not the most interesting thing i mean if you can do mm. something that wows people on a technical level with sci-fi especially with time travel or even ai that's cool but it doesn't hold my attention and for right. me Identity is the biggest theme that runs through all of my stories. And I've tried to write different genres as writing exercises. So I've done historical fiction, I've done horror, I've done, this is my first sci-fi one. I, I did a rom-com last year. So it's, you know, I just want to write about the things that interest me and, and uh, I don't want to get pigeonholed into one genre. Yeah, I think the challenge of, uh, of, of any genre and, and any, a- any world building is making sure the world building gets out of the way of the emotion, right? Like you got to keep yeah. it. Mm-hmm. You don't want to get so distracted by it that you forget about the emotion. It, unless that's your thing. Like some people can write amazing world building and make that the 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 secret sauce. To me, it's like I want my rules to be simple and clean, so that you're not thinking about it. So you're like, oh, that's a cool razzle dazzle, but I care. I care, and I'm focused in that emotion. And and uh, Jeremy, similar. Uh, I think I always like to write myself into different genres because it's so easy to pigeonhole us as writers. And also I feel like you become a better writer when you write a different genre and you bring it to the other one. Like when I wrote Skyward, it was a, it, it's a big, uh, crazy action adventure. I wanted to write something with horror. Hmm. Shadecraft isn't horror, but it is like, it's very similar to that tone with a touch of horror. Hmm. And I'm going to bring that lesson to my next book. It's like whenever you're, whenever you dive into a different genre, you bring back the lessons you've learned and you've challenged yourself. Uh, and I think that's such an important part of the process because that's what makes you grow and not uh, just repeat what you're doing. Yeah, I, I, I did a crime book last year called Bog Bodies and it was meant to be a crime book, but um, I was talking about my editor about it and she pointed out, and uh, this is a horror. I was like, oh. And I kind of looked at her, I was like, well, actually it is a horror. I, I didn't realize that's not where I, what I was thinking, but, but it was a survivalist horror story effectively. But it was kind of funny that I wrote into a genre I had no intention of writing into. Hmm. So it's kind of like allowing yourself to have the freedom to let it morph into whatever genre or whatever way it's going to go because it's just going to go that way anyway. I, I, I think maybe sometimes the genre stuff comes from like how we're how we're supposed to sell the book, you know, like you have you have to say what the type, you know, for for the graphic novel or you need to know what the genre is for solicitations. So you start end up yeah. maybe you start end up putting your story into boxes for the sake of like selling you know um, Mm -hmm. and that may not have been your intention but uh it's i I don't know it's maybe a weird feedback loop happens Mm. 
it's probably better to just start with the story that you want and then just end up yeah then distilling down oh is this horror or is this crime like which one actually is it yeah i'm often pinging back and forth i'm like i often have pinging? a character document and pinging pinging, pinging. Oh, okay <laughs> uh, I often have like a, a character document and a world document. And if I've like, because sometimes the rules of the world need to be whittled down because they're getting too unwieldy. And then I go to the character document and I always find that having sort of those two existing make sure that I treat them with equal both respect, but also like, I don't want the world to be more important than the character, but mm -hmm. I also need to spend uh, sometimes as much time on it because I need, it needs that uh, refinement to get out of the way of the most important thing, which is the character. Hmm. It's, it's interesting I think me and Rory have kind of split duties on that a little bit where you know things I'm thinking about are kind of like broader themes or whatever and Rory's like really really good at world building I like hmm. I don't think I, people have been saying hey your new book is, is great it's the best thing you've written I'm like yeah it's probably because of Rory but <laughs> um, <laughs> but Rory digs in in world building way that I haven't really done before and um, as a writer it's interesting to kind of have some stu somebody who does something very good that you haven't put as much experience at because it's mm -hmm. kind of it's it's pushed me a lot um, uh, in the kind of work I'm playing around with. Yeah, I think the world building stuff is like you need to have it, but you don't need to show it because that's just going to bog you down a lot of the time. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you need to not like you put in so much work behind the scenes, and you mm -hmm. should never show it unless it's absolutely necessary yeah. um like there's just documents and scenes and stuff that will never should never be seen yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I, you, you, like, you only tell them oh sorry jeremy oh no go ahead, go ahead go ahead well no it's just that you um damn no i've forgotten sorry no you go ahead <laughs> <laughs> sorry uh i realized that i had some limitations with that because i just was running out of space to tell the story i wanted to tell and the world building was something i didn't want to focus on but I decided to utilize um, three pages as um, additional space to tell these backup stories, focusing on other proxies to get the reader involved and see what the life of other proxies are and how these families raise their kids. Because, you know, I was, you know, I'm an identical triplet. I have uh, that all three of us were adopted and I, I've met other Korean adoptees and their experiences are very different. So mm. I wanted to kind of show that, but I didn't have room in the principal story to, to explore it. So I, you know, utilized three pages in the back. Hmm. That's smart. Is, is that across all issues or yeah. just one? So I, I brought on six artists to tell their proxy story. I gave them the rules of how the world of Made in Korea works, and they were able to just tell whatever story they wanted to tell. Hmm. Awesome. That's cool. That's great. Um, so going off of character, I mean, it sounds like you're a lot of you are kind of um, bringing in your own personal narratives to your characters, but is there ever a moment with any of these books where you kind of started with a almost fully formed character in mind? Was there just like a persistent person that just kept coming that you were kind of like visualizing and then decided to write a book around it or? Yeah. <laughs> those jerks like okay if you've been writing his name for was while, dracula <laughs> <laughs> um, every, well i mean this is this is this is for different projects i mean for bad karma like sully and ethan have kind of just arrived in my head and started yelling at each other and i'm like well i guess i'm writing a book about them now um okay. you know i had another like right in the middle of like i you know i've had another character just pop into my head well like, I usually do it like a combination of characters because I tend to write like buddy stories a lot these days apparently um and like two characters with a very specific dynamic will pop into my head and I had and the story that I'm trying to plot out right now you know I there's just the character that won't leave it's like you're writing about me now um and it will probably take a couple of years but eventually you will see a story about this character He's very like, it's a very specific person. Like he's very fully mm -hmm. realized. Like he has a certain way of doing things. He's very kind of particular. Um, and yeah, I think I very, very nuanced. I mean, and, you know, he bears almost no resemblance to me except in very tangential situations. Mm. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's a split between characters. I mean, I also wrote a, a time travel story called Skip to the End, but uh, didn't get into the hard science of it. And I, would classify it as magical realism, mm -hmm. but I was basically exploring my profound love for the for the band Nirvana, and I 
just basically did a revisionist history of the band uh, through a fictional version. And I just have always believed that music is a form of time travel. So pairing the idea that music is time travel with this band kind of had the, this, you know, I wanted to focus on the basis of this band and, and focus on loss and, and addiction. And uh, with Maiden Korea, it was, it needed to be a child because, uh, you know, adoption, when people think of ad ad adoption, they think of adopting children. And so I always had in my mind a uh, Korean girl um, and kind of wrote around that. Um, but sometimes it's really just a concept that drives my, my stories forward and then characters mm. emerge. Yeah, I was going to say concept and theme are the two big things that usually are the push pull. Like Skyward, I wanted to do a low gravity world. So I wanted, and I wanted someone who loved it because I, I was tired of po post apocalyptic stories. I wanted a post apocalyptic story that was both terrifying because if you jump too high, you don't come down, but also wonderful because you can fly. And I wanted her to represent the positive side of it. And that was sort of just the starting point, but then her character started to come out and then she started pushing and pulling with it. And so to me, I usually sort of start with, okay, how does the character thematically relate to the world, but then also let the character start to say, hey, guess what? I don't, I, I might be inconsistent or I might go this different direction. I, I am my own person and follow that character. Like once your characters start surprising you, uh, you're, mm. it, it, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's weird because your own brain is sort of arguing with you, but that's also when they come alive, right? That's the fun. That's the fun the is when you're, yeah, it's when they say like, hey, I'm actually going to zag when you thought I was going to zig. Mm -hmm, that and, and yeah, and I love instead of fighting it, embracing it and letting them live. But that's usually after um, I've laid a lot of groundwork thematically. Yeah, I love that point where like, you've you've got a, an outline of, of, of the story and you, you're, you're in the depths of writing it and your character goes, this is a convenient choice. I'm going to make a real choice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then you, then you know you're cooking gas, basically. Mm. I think that's something with characters you have to continually be asking yourself is, you know, is this a real choice? Mm. Like, would, it, would, would a real person, would this person with their likes and dislikes and tendencies actually make this choice or would they make another one? Because we, we, we really want to hustle them along to like the fight scenes and the big scenes and the ending, but if, if they're not believable in what they're doing in a really human way, you're going to lose the reader along the way, or they're just not, you know, they're not gonna care as much as you want them to. Do all of you rely on your outlines? My outlining is where my, the heavy creative lifting is for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I tend to kind of workshop everything through on the outline. Um, uh, and just, cause I, I find I am, um, like I was saying before, what Rory's good at, I'm, I'm not as good at. and. I, I work with an editor who kind of forces me to dig in more because I because that's where, like I said, just because it's not on the page doesn't mean I don't need to know what the answer is. Um, but at the same time, I'll, I'll work. I'll, I'll like um, um, uh, like Alex was saying, if if the character is going another way, I, I'm not too bothered about the, that the plot can change. You know, I feel like I need a structure to work from and mm. play within that sandbox and if, if things. I think in both. Like Bog Bodies, I think I changed the ending past the halfway point at one stage, um, just because it just it was going the other way, uh, and that was really cool. It was really exciting uh, story wise, but of course it has to fit, which is the other thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I need to kind of, as as someone who draws, a lot of people seem to think that like I'll kind of like draw images and you know you know organically make story, but I actually try and work like script outline hammer things down before I ever start drawing something because I, I need to I need to have it all figured out by the time I draw. I spend a lot of time beforehand decide, like growing the story to the point where it's ready to be written and that's a lot of basic you know like in in in, in my in my wee notebook um all of it, <laughs> really terrible handwriting because uh, uh, yes. I can sit out in the dog park and in the sunshine and like you know not be alt tabbing away to twitter or something like that and focus um, and once the story is ready to be written, there's a lot of basic outlining done. I've asked myself the questions like, you know, what is this about? You know, really interrogating the characters and their goals and their limitations and so forth. Then I go through this kind of three-step process in terms of, okay, it's ready to write now. You know what the ending is, you know how to get there, you know, like, you know, the people. And that's outline, which is what happens per chapter. And again, I, you know, a chapter can be an issue. Like I tend to write graphic novels because I don't like having Jeremy's problem of like, Oh, you can only fit this much of your world building in the first 20 pages. Yeah, no, just make it 32. Um, 
So I do an outline, that's what happens per chapter. Then I do breakdowns, which are what happens per page. And there's a lot of temp dialogue thrown in there and it doesn't have to make any sense. Like your outline absolutely does not have to be the kind of school outline of like, you know, Roman numeral one dot, blah, blah, blah. Like it can just be just some mess in a notebook. It's just like a sketch, but with words. Um, so breakdowns are what happens per page. Um, and that's where you start to really pace out the story as a visual document. And then the script is what happens per panel. And I think there are generally fairly large flexes between outline and breakdowns. And again, between breakdowns and script, because sometimes you'll write a scene. And it's like, it actually needs two extra pages or like this would be better as a splash page or, oh, I want to do a splash page there, which means I have to go add a page here. So it ends up on the right, it ends up on a left-hand page, yada, yada. Um, so that's, that's kind of the process. So there's a constant rewriting process imbued into it. And then, cause I'm a weirdo, I letter my own books, which most writers don't do. So there's yet another process of going back, looking over the art and like not rewriting it, but just rejigging everything to fit. Yeah, I, I, when I, from again, sorry, I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but I'm an artist. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I was very scared to write because, you know, I gained a level of confidence with that art with, with drawing that I didn't have with writing. And I kept thinking like, well, when I write, I'm going to have to do this and it goes into the machine and it's done. Whereas when I actually started doing it, it just felt way more like sculpture that you're, you make a block of something and it's a mess and then you put it away and then you come back and then you refine it. So it, it felt more like an art project, like, like um, an illustration project, you know, where you're doing your roughs and then you do your pencils and you do your inks. Mm -hmm. And I didn't expect that it was going to be like that, um, but it made it way more accessible for me. Whereas I think the idea of being a writer was, you know, too intimidating for a long time it's really like it's really good to just be like I'm just going to attempt this in and like attempt some dialogue in I guarantee you most of that dialogue will end up in the final issue um okay. so if you're just free to be like oh well I'm just going to sketch this in I'll come back and fix it later it, it lets you it lets you um it, it's very intimidating like nobody I, I know um and everyone works differently but nobody I know just sits down and writes the thing and it's perfect like perfect form I'm, I'm guilty of trying to do that when I was starting out because I'm <laughs> Perfectionist, but I think with the outlining and then the issue breakdowns and then the actual scripting, like you said, Alex, there's this editorial process that gets kind of naturally uh, worked into, into getting to the final product. And I never, I went to art school. I hated filling sketchbooks. I hated doing something more than once, which is why I ended up in tech because when you're fixing a computer, you're supposed to only do it once. Um, <laughs> but with the process, I've gotten used to just reworking things and being okay with oh, I have to throw out these three pages because they don't work. Or, you know, my collaborator will come back to me and say, hey, we need to, I want to add this panel or move this panel to this page. And so, okay, as long as the pacing's intact, I don't really mind what you want to do. Mm -hmm. I think so much of our creative process is giving ourselves free to, uh, permission to fail, freedom to fail. And knowing that failure isn't uh, a mistake, it is the process and it is the step. Like, and failure is not even exactly the right word for it. It's more just, it's first draft, second draft, third draft, fourth draft, fourth draft just get something on the page because once the people start talking, once the characters start breathing, once it exists, I feel like so many people just get caught up on that one perfect pass. And the answer is mm. it, it okay. doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah. But and uh, also, and like, if you're stuck at a point, just put brackets in there and put fight scene here or argument scene here, or like, you know, Jesse goes to school for first day here and then come back to it. Mm. You yeah. don't have to write it then. You can just go it's on. process. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Rory's caught me a few times doing that because it'll be a uh, who's look 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 and a character <laughs> couldn't think of a name, so I just swiped my my thumb across the keyboard and said I'll get to it later. And, and by the way, of... entertaining yourself on the page—that's half the battle too. Like sometimes you're mm -hmm. going to be like, you know what? I'm going to just going to name this character Black, and like it's those little like sort of self hacks you can do to be like, I'll come back to that, but I'll come back to it and I'll laugh and I'll be like, okay, I actually need to put a real name here. But it's really funny that I just, you know, mashed a keyboard for a little bit. Like, take care of yourself. When you're side characters it. and henchmen's stupid names to make your artist laugh is like really key. Yes. Um, but then you have these intense conversations about, well, what's Chip doing if Dale is doing that? You know? <laughs> oh, man. We, I mean, I, uh, I run a show called Lucifer and um, like the number of fake names that just make it through. Where you're like, oh, that's a temp you know, name. Some poor actor on their IMDb doesn't have like <laughs> yeah. Lucifer yeah. season three. <laughs> like John McGillicuddy the seventeenth is like, like who is this guy? Oh, he's got this great backstory. No, it's just a random name we said because it was funny and it made us laugh. Um, yeah. But at the same time, it's funny and it makes you laugh <laughs> and it keeps things going. 
I think it's just something about your character, Joe. If I managed to mention I was an artist 15 times and you just mentioned that you run a TV show. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, like I got to really keep well up to you, you know, got to like. <laughs> wow. Um, that is one thing that I'm curious about when you're all working on different projects. Some of them aren't comics. Some of them are. Um, how do you keep all the characters straight? Especially if your projects are different genres. Um, how do you keep that kind of fresh in your mind? One thing I just want to jump back to before we move on that is um, baby writers, please talk to your artists and show them your um, outlines at an early stage and your breakdowns because while you're still learning how many panels to put on the page and how to pace, it's really, really important to give your artists feedback also because it makes them feel part of the process and like they're bringing something to the story um, and you're learning how to work in a collaborative environment. So please take advantage of your artist's knowledge and ideas and stuff. Um, it's and give them time to do research because they're going to need to draw that stuff too. And mm -hmm. invest them. Like yes. Alex, what you're saying, like, like have them feel like they're a part of it. I mean, they are a part of it. And if they're a part of it at that early stage, you're going to get better work out of them. And also, if you have a project that's really research heavy, do the Googling yourself. Your artist is not being paid enough and they are certainly not being paid to Google. So if you, like again, I keep bringing up bad karma, but it's got a ton of um, military tech in it. And I have friends who will write me letters if the military tech is not correct. Um, but who will also tell me what to put in. Um, so I, I Google it, put a link in there to an image file and go, it's this, yeah. here's yeah. an image of it. And then Ryan can go from there. Or, you know, like, or I suggest it, like I give him location wrap if he needs it. And he's free, he knows he's free to like, just pick a different location if he doesn't like what I said, but at least I've tried to do some of the work. And so he's, he's mostly able to just sit there and draw and click ref rather than be going like, okay, God, like what kind of vehicle is this? And right. what would it be and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, I've been looking to work with artists or with writers who who, who do that. But uh, I wrote and drew something for for Marvel recently, and as I was writing it, I was doing some research. I'm like, oh, oh this will be handy. I don't need to look this up now when I'm drawing. <laughs> Make sure I saved all the research as I was looking up the writing. So that was that was uh, pretty handy. Uh, but sorry, what was your your question again, um, Marla? Oh, keep, um, keep the characters yeah. straight. Yeah. So oh. I think for me, writing different. Like I'm I'm writing a a young adult graphic novel right now that's very different than anything I've previously written. And for me, I listen to a ton of music and I will create soundtracks for books I'm, I'm writing. I'll even create soundtracks for the characters. And once I put that music on, I'm in the, I can get in that headspace right away. Mm -hmm. And it, I'm walking into a different town in my mind. And then I can get the vibe and the pacing and, and the themes and all that um, going. Mm -hmm. You kind of read back over the old stuff a little bit. And also like, if you've done a lot of character development work in the beginning, which like, as you write more and more characters, you find yourself having to do, like when you start out, you're like, oh, I'm just gonna wing it. Um, and then, you know, the sixth or seventh or eighth book down the line or the, even earlier, um, you're like, okay, well now I actually need to do a deep dive into like, what are these characters goals? What are their limitations? What, you know, what's, what's, what's their sort of catchphrase? How do they feel about life? What are they gonna have to get over in order to, you know, what deep seated fear they're gonna have to get over to push the story forward, like all the script notes kind of stuff. Um, and that that helps a lot because you can go back and be like, oh, it's this person. I usually like, it, you usually jump back and forth into it really easily. Like it's not as hard as you think it is coming from outside, but having the, the cheat sheets help. I have a lot of friends who are like, I don't know how I can do more than one project or two projects at a time. And the answer I usually give them is you can, it's just a muscle. Like, it's just, you've, it, you've got to practice it. Like at first it's hard because you got this thing that you're, you know, micro-focused on and you're putting your all into and that's great. But then like build up the muscle, work on the second project, work on the third. Like uh, your, your brain is adapting to these things. Find those good habits, uh, like Alex was talking about that help you find it, find the music that uh, cues you in. But also just know that like, it's, it's, it's a muscle like anything else and you've got to teach it and grow it and build it and you will. Um, if you if you work at it, and I I find my my um, recently I've just kind of discovered I have a limit as regards my uh, brainscape of what I can how many you know if it's time before time or something else I'm thinking of or like I'll, I'll I generally have like three different things I'm either writing or drawing so I find it hard uh, I I need to silo myself off for like because I'm drawing something at the moment uh, for Marvel and Rory just sent me the new um, the new edits for the next issue time before time and i'm like mm -hmm. great i'm gonna read that tonight like i can't read it now because i'm in a certain headspace so i need to switch out of that 
and switch into the writing one. So I, I do I do find that kind of hard to to, to balance. But what about you, Rory? Because I know like you do a lot of short stories for 2000 AD. So mm. I think a lot, it's a lot of kind stuff of there. leveraging that kind of step approach of like breaking projects down into different stages and just getting yourself to a point where on one you're so wrecked you're actually excited to jump into the other one and kind of <laughs> leveraging it that way. So yeah. kind of knowing saw, when you get to that breaking point and then yeah. I saw, I saw a good meme. I think that's what they're called on Twitter the other day, which is, uh, <laughs> it's like somebody- We're not that old, Dick, come on. <laughs> I, know, I think I it's called a, I think it's called a meme. A meme? Um, <laughs> it was, uh, it was, um, it was uh, effectively, you know, the project, the project you're working on, but you're looking out the window at the project that's coming out. And then the one that you're looking at, the one that you're excited about, you're looking, it's just this weird thing. The thing you're always on is not the one you're excited about. It's because mm. you're probably just doing the work. You're just getting it actually mm. sitting down and actually typing. Because I hate writing. I, I don't like writing. I don't like writing. I like having written, if that makes oh, sense. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, I think for me, it's like the characters to me are my friends. And if I... I need to make them interesting enough where I want to hang out with them. If I can't make them interesting enough to hang out with, mm. no one's going to be mm. interested in reading about them. So totally. I kind of get really excited about getting back to these little, you know, worlds. And I think all of us have these very rich inner worlds we spend so much time in. And if you don't like, you know, build a house and have nice furniture in it, you're like walking around and you're tired and you don't want to be there. So. Well, uh, but I imagine for someone like you, Joe, like writing for TV is a different muscle than writing mm. your comic. So there, you're going to get, there's going to be things you like and dislike about each uh, thing. Same with Rory and doing the uh, 2000 D short stories. Like a short story is a different muscle than like a 22 page single issue. And exactly to that point, I think one of the things that's helpful is um, you have one project at the outline phase, one project at the script phase, one project at the proof uh, phase, because that's another way to sort of segment them into different parts of your brain. And then like when you're exhausted by drafting dialogue and digging into the character stuff, you know what, I'll go a little more macro and talk about the world and all of this. Mm -hmm. And it's like finding different ways to give yourself a break. But also uh, I do think we all have ceilings and sometimes what you don't want to do is keep pushing to the point where uh, you're overstretching yourself. Like it is, it's that balance of like pushing yourself so that you can do more and in doing more actually help your other projects. So it's like, oh, by thinking about Skyward, I actually came up with the idea for Shadecraft because it's right. the shower effect. But it's also not going, I'm taking on so much that I'm going to burn myself out. Yeah, I'm like oh, super busy all the time across like about four different forms of media, which, um, you know, do, do not recommend. <laughs> um, but it's fun. Um, I, like you just get like the busier you get, the more hardcore about your time management you get. Mm -hmm. Like and people are like, can you look at this thing? And you're like, no, I can look at it next week. Yep. That's it. You yeah. Know? Like I have, building on what Declan said, like I have a couple of, you know, what both of you said, like I, I you know, I have the, the writing project I'm focusing on. And this week it was polishing a pilot that someone was yelling at me about because sometimes I just do what the last person who yells at me loud <laughs> wants. Um, so yeah, the pilot that was due earlier this week that is still not finished. Um, so I'm working on that. And then next week I've got to work and, you know, I've got to do some coordination on an audio book. And then I've got to start lettering the new panel syndicate project. Um, and then, you know, figure out what I'm going to write for my third novel will happen like somewhere down the line. So there's like this very much is this regimented, you know, my time cannot be spent on certain things. I cannot have a pure focus on, on more than one writing project at any given time where I'm actually writing it. I just finished up the like, next arc of Full Tilt Boogie for 2000 AD, which is five to six page mm -hmm. chapters, which is real fun. Um, and yeah, you just keep it going. Like you just, you just have to not necessarily have this, be, be writing two open projects the same week because then my brain sort of falls over. I can look at art, you know, I'm still looking at art for reversal and for bad karma there. That's coming in and I'm reviewing it and giving notes, um, but I can't be writing more than one story a week. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I hate Jeff Lemire. Um, mm. uh, in that, uh, well, I, was just, I read a blog post that he had where he basically says he'll just take a project and just write the whole project. he just do the five issues. He'll just write them and then he'll move on. And I, I generally find like I'm right into a deadline or an artist needs something or I have to get something in for it. So like, it's, it's, it's tough to, to manage those kind of siloing of the processes when everything needs to be in at some stage. Um, it would, I, I like. I really like the idea of being able to just kind of do one thing for a while and do the next thing, and have it work out. But it, it just hasn't worked out that way. I, uh, See, I love ping ponging. 
Yeah, I love popping around. It 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 keeps mm. me fresh. Like I, oh, we all hate Jeff, right? I mean, I'm not the only. <laughs> no, I don't think Jeff part of <laughs> okay, but I just assume. <laughs> but yeah, I, could have looked I bad. actually, I love going. Like I'm working on a pilot today. I was working on it yesterday as well. The day before, I was working on a different pilot. The day before, I was l- working on some shadecraft stuff. Like I, uh, I was watching cuts from Lucifer. Like I, to me, it keeps me fresh. As long as Alex, to your point, I know I, I'm segmenting it off, and that mm. I've got like I've got a window of time where I'm going to do this, and that they're all at different stages. Like mm. I know that yeah. I've got a pilot that needs to go in. The other ones are revision. Okay, revisions are different. Those are it's a different brain. I'm not going full cloth. So okay, I could do uh, a page one here, but I could do some revisions here. And if I'm hitting a wall here, I just shift over here for a day. And then I come back here and I'm like, got it. Or I tell myself that and then I get mad. <laughs> the worst thing is hitting that wall and feeling like you can't go anywhere. You know, the mm. like, ping pong I like as well, because the worst is just sitting, staring at either a you know, notebook or your computer or a wall going, I'm stuck. Yeah. And if you just kind of keep moving, like kind of like a shark, you know? Yeah. No, I can't. I can't do issue by issue. I, I write the whole project, so right. I do what Jeff does, and the the whole pro, the whole project seventy five page graphic. <laughs> um, so that's the focus, and I finish that, and then it goes to the art team. Um, so I imagine doing- it's more focused. I imagine you like you you build a momentum that follows through faster than because what I find is if I cut onto something else, especially art wise, I don't just come back. To grind back in to work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons I do it, and also I just I like knowing how long a project is because for graphic novels you don't know until it's finished because I write until the story's done and then I stop, um, and then you know then also it's it's locked off and now in a different stage I'm either revising it or I'm starting to look at I'll be starting to look out at at, at layouts soon so you know that's that's nice because I can like cross it off my little list and be like that's written now. <laughs> actually, that that makes me want to ask actually Joe and um, and Jeremy like um. How are you? Are you writing? Are you writing um, uh, both books like to end at a certain point? Because it's one thing me and Rory keep like having to think is like, do, are we going to have to end this at six? Or you know, you want to tell a complete story and not just cash in and all the, the things you drop. But it's as doing creator on comics, it's hard to know if an audience will find your your book. I I, I mean, Made in Korea is six issues. Uh, George and I have roughly we've discussed this and I have a rough outline for two more six issue arcs, but mm. whether we get to tell that or not is yet to be seen. So we're just kind of focusing on this might be the only made in Korea that there is. Um, so. Yeah, we, yeah, we did I, the uh, same on, we, yeah, we did the same. We wrote it so we might have to like, you know, ugh, jump out the door, the, the, the car for <laughs> crashes to issue six, but, but, but then we got a second <laughs> arc. So, but, but now we're in a weird place where we're now we feel like we're capitalizing on everything we've built it's going to be harder to kind of pull out uh, if, if that happens. And it may, maybe it won't, it, but, but you can't help but worry about it, you know? Yeah, I, I have a, the, the car into the crashes, I think. <laughs> I have a yeah. really hard time not knowing where a story is ending. Um, mm. Like, for example, like with uh, Skyward, uh, we had seven issues done before we even came out. So I just was like, you know what? Either it's wow. going to be a, uh, some sort of a success or I'm just going to eat that money. And it was both. I ate the money and it was sort of a success. So, but it was like, I need to know at least an arc. So like with Shadecraft before it even started, I had the first five issues done. Um, and then, and to me, it was like, all right, first five issues with an ending that could be a beginning. Cause similarly, mm-hmm. it's like, who knows how this is gonna do? Uh, and it's actually done very well, but also Lee and I got busy. So it's just those five issues for now. And then hopefully we'll revisit down the line. But to me, I always try to find like a, a, a story, a beginning, middle, and end with a beginning that can come. Because to me, that's life. It's like the stories are very rarely actually over, but I want to make sure that when you read the book, you mm-hmm. have a very satisfying beginning, middle, end in the sense of, okay, I have finished this journey, but boy, I wonder what they do next. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And that sort of protects both against the unreliability of publishing, but also the sense of, um, of wanting to have a, a complete story and not feel kind of cheated by the experience of, oh, there's just a prologue. It should, it's its own story. You're, you're probably used to that from like writing in TV where, I mean, I don't know how it works, but I assume you don't really know if you have another season. Exactly. Like we always, we always try to tell a season that is a beginning, middle and end, but can tease the next. And so I just sort of carried that over, except on Skyward where I was like, F it. 
um it's gonna be 15 issues minimum no matter what uh, i'm a crazy person and then <laughs> luckily we were able to do that and and complete it so that is a tricky balance i know like as a reader i always like it when it's left with a little bit of a question mark and then we can kind of see how it goes from there whether it gets another arc or not yeah people but, are, Rory and i have an ending it's just you know where can we capitalize on the stories and characters as much as possible before we get to that ending? And, and the more we talk, the more it seems like there's more of a, of a, of a track we can take. Um, but that's it. It's just like, yeah, how do we, the ending isn't the problem. It's how much space, how, how much can we really dig into the, to this story and idea, um, which is exciting, but like, yeah, the realities of publishing and, I mean, mm -hmm. really, you're writing the whole thing before you know if you have an audience, which is is, is difficult. It's a it's a tough tough uh, axe to swing. Yeah. Um. Well, we're about to wrap up, but I just wanted to quickly get an idea of what each of you kind of want to see from the comic book industry in general. Like, what do you think is missing, either from like sci-fi or like speculative fiction in general um or like representation or what to you is like missing in comics right now because i feel like all of you have been in it long enough to kind of get an idea of like oh i have this idea or i have this vision for something and i haven't seen that yet what would that be I'm curious um i i'd like to see more of what's happening in that creators having a singular vision of what their story is and making it happen. Like uh, very excited to see Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips do their graphic novels um, in that format that they're doing, the way they're doing it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'd like to see other crime books sell as well as them. <laughs> um, uh, but I think, I, I think it's as exciting. I like to see creators actually take advantage of what image can do with image comics mm. and take chances and do interesting things um, when it comes to the design, when it comes to the, you know, one thing I'm really happy about Time Before Time is I just feel like we've made a really good book um, aside from what me and Rory did. But like, I think, I think we did a good job, but Joe's work is, is so, so interesting and Chris's colors are so um bold and uncompromising and Sasha's design. Like, I just feel like we made a good object. Um, and you can do that with image. You can choose your paper stock. You can choose how many pages it's going to be. You don't have the restrictions that other publishers have. And um, I like seeing creators take advantage of that, whoever they are, wherever they're from, whatever kind of story they want to tell. Um, I'm going to pick up something that feels like the most distilled version of what the creator had to the page I don't really care what it's about or, mm. you know, the story doesn't necessarily, uh, or the genre, I'm not really that bothered, but I, I think you can tell when something has been made in the most uncompromising way as possible. And uh, that's what really excites me. Mm. I think for me, representation, um, more POC writers, um, specifically writers, because I've been, I've been trying to compile a list of POC writers that have gotten into comics like myself that went directly into comics, wasn't coming from another, um, uh, or industry. So like Ram V is like someone that I, I have gotten to know and, and his work is amazing. And, it, and it's great that he's telling stories um, that are authentic to, to him and his, um, his background and experiences. And I'd like to see more uh, people of color um, telling their stories. And I mean, for me, the, for the longest time I was writing these white savior stories and I know why as an adoptee who was raised in a, mm. a partially white household that's what I identified as. And I identified as American and specifically white American. And when I decided to stop doing that in 2017 and, and lean into my own personal truths, you know, I think I wrote, I've written better stories because of it. And I, and I think um, more POC, POC should have the opportunity and should really swing for the fences and tell those stories. Um, I'm going to say something both similar and different because uh, I think more uh, white male writers need to challenge themselves outside of uh, our comfort zones a bit. Um, one of the things I've tried to do is write um, characters of color, female characters, characters that aren't as present on, on the, the shelves. When I did Skyward, 
I, uh, I looked at the shelf and I'm like, the thing that I don't see, that I see the least is uh, black female characters. So I'll make my lead a black female character. And, and then with Shadecraft, um, I really wanted to tell an Asian American family. And then and specifically, uh, I went Chinese American and I just spoke to a whole bunch of friends and it forced me out of a comfort zone. It forced me out of, um, it, it's tricky because I'm a white guy telling stories about um, a POC protagonists, but instead of being afraid of that, I decided to just empower the people around me to help me learn, help me grow. And I benefited from it as a storyteller. Um, and I think it's also just important to have those characters on the shelves. Uh, one, hopefully to inspire the future generations of writers who do reflect uh, those people on the page, but also um, because if things get optioned, like, you that that person's going to be cast as a person of color and obviously we're not making books to be optioned i think that's very important that if you're making a book the book needs to stand on its own and be its own thing but we can't deny the fact that a lot of books do get optioned and if you make the protagonists or a number of the characters uh people of color you're going to then those people are going to be cast that way and i think that's an incredibly helpful part of the dna as we move forward um, to create those writers of the future. I just want to see um, more companies that have better deals for creators um, because it, like image is wonderful, um, but image can only use like image can only publish so many books and there are a lot of people making comics right now. And I just see, you know, I know a lot of the other deals and you know, companies are taking large, large amounts of rights and especially secondary rights and not really paying very good uh, page rates. Um, so you essentially get the image deal, but then they take like control of your secondary rights. And let me tell you, like when that deal eventually turns into a Netflix deal, I know how much the EP is being paid at, you know, at the comic book co company, the name listed on the comic book company rather than the creator name. I know what they get out of that versus what your option fee was. And, it, and let me tell you, you just, you know, you just turn down the money for a house. I think something to be aware of too is if there wasn't an image, all those it would be a race to the bottom with the other publishers mm. it wouldn't be a case of is it is it 50 50 anymore it's well how much percentage of your own idea can you keep it's a 20 is a 10 like if there was an image then there will be nowhere there'll be nowhere to go where you can just go no i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it yeah not nowhere but like as regards in the the media no the i think i think nowhere is right yeah no, i mean <laughs> to be fair i'm sorry i'm to be fair here um uh, Dark Horse keep, lets you keep all your rights, E2 lets you keep all your rights. I, I do W do as well. There's different oh. deals. Yeah, you know, but, uh, but, but without any, image, I think, you know, yeah. it would any fall of apart. The, the, the big five trade publishers, um, their deals are, are publishing only. Um, and they tend to give advances, which is why so many of us are doing YA in middle grade right now, because, you know, they'll give you six figures for a book. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I just echo that, that it would be nice if image wasn't such a an exception that it was more the norm mm. in terms of uh, rights, but also, and I think we're heading in the way this way already, but further mm. diversification of formats in the direct market and stuff would be great to see more of. Yeah. 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 Like I love seeing one shots and mini series and graphic novels and oversized things and like, yeah, diversification across the board is a, is a good, because I think the yeah. audience is, the audience has diversified in a huge way and they may not want to read time before time as single issues. They might just want to read the trade or they just, they want to read it episodically or you want to read mm -hmm. a one shot by a creator that you really like. I think um, the more different types of material there is out there, the, the, the better for the, the better for the creator and the better for the reader. Mm. That's great. Well, for anybody who's watching this right now, if you do feel like any of that resonates with you and you have a pitch, uh, just, email us submissions at imagecomics.com. I look over those, our publisher looks over those. Like there's, it doesn't hurt to try. You might as well get your idea out there. Um, and we have more FAQs on our website too. Uh, thank yeah, you I, 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 everyone. Sorry, I'll just say like on top, on top of that, like, um, cause people always ask, how do you do it? Like, you're not gonna do it by not trying. You know, yeah. the, the, the worst thing you, like the one way you'll definitely fail is if you don't try. That's, that's the one guaranteed way to fail. So and why not? Yeah, just make something, make something that's, that's, that at least shows what you can do, you know? And then do it again and again and again. And, and again. it's okay that you get, yeah. Like the yeah. rejections, oh. rejections are steps. 
we all, I, I wish I could tell everybody like now. it's it's not just a form yeah. thing like when we say like uh you know feel free to submit something again I really mean that and there's so many submissions where it's it is just a timing thing like like maybe there's we're over our catalog is oversaturated with a certain story right now so we're probably not going to go this way right at this moment but keep submitting stuff it has yeah, there's it no took harm in 12 it. years 12 years to get in with image so you just gotta um you just have to not quit that's the one rule just don't quit yeah what's the worst that could happen <laughs> nothing <laughs> you just got to keep trying yeah, your comic book isn't published now. If they say no, it's still not published. So you're like net zero. And, and, yeah, you and lose you, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, also, you lose nothing. Also, a lot of people I think are afraid that they're like, oh, I just I just submitted this and now they put Joe Henderson in the bad writer pile because they said no. And the answer is no. Seriously? They put you in the, oh, wow, this is really good writing, but not great for us. Or, hey, this person's finding their voice. I'm going to keep an eye on them. Failure Absolutely. is often the path. And that's, I think, the thing that <laughs> or, is- Or it's who? Yeah, they get enough of those. Either. They're like, ah, oh, Declan again. All right, I guess this Not guy clearly wants to get in. I will say there are plenty of like names that I recognize in submissions now where it's like, this is the fifth, sixth submission this year. And it's like, oh, it's so close. Every single time it's closer and closer. And I do have that separate folder of like, this one is one to keep an eye on. So yeah, because you also can see this is somebody who is, is keeps trying, is working, and developing. Like not somebody who tried it and then never tried again. I think exactly. that happens. I'm sure. I'm sure that happens all the time. But I'm sure you're going to notice the same name keeping to trying and developing. Totally. You're like, okay, they're 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 getting places. Like they're you're yeah. you're going to pick up on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, thank you everyone so much for joining. Maybe... I can't wait to just see people again. Yeah. yeah. Same, same, definitely. Um, well, thank you to everybody watching too. Please go out and buy these comic books. They will all be available by the time we're out. Yee! We got Shadecraft, Dracula Mofo, Time Before Time, and Made in Korea. And they're all honestly quality. I enjoyed reading every single one. Yeah, thank you so much, San Diego Comic Con. We appreciate you watching, and we'll see y'all soon. Bye. Bye bye.